Hello, good evening everybody. This is Priya Parthasarthi. I'm very happy to meet you all here today. Thank you to Hetic Digital Business School for giving me this opportunity to interact with you. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about growth versus scale, lessons from startups. Let me first introduce myself to you. I'm the digital director at Prequel Labs, a company I run along with my partners for offering digital branding and advertising solutions online based in Chennai. Prior to my role as a digital marketing consultant, I used to run an e-commerce startup called Mayazar. A lot of my experience on digital marketing and what I'm going to be talking to you about um, startups and growth so will all come from my experience of running this uh, e-commerce startup. It was Maya's art was a uh, partnership between myself and my friend, best friend. He had started this in 2010 selling handmade fashion jewelry online. What was a hobby business grew into something substantial. And uh, I'll be sharing a lot of insights from the mistakes to avoid while running a startup especially in the digital space. Also a world traveler and a mother of two. Um, I've been told that uh, many of you have uh, small startups, you have uh, digital businesses running as a, you know, a part-time digital business. Uh, I'd like to, um, I'd like to know what was the motive behind your starting of a business? Well, some say that uh, they, they get into the entrepreneur space because uh, they have a brilliant idea which could change the world, which could solve a crisis, which, which could make a difference in people's life or some or sometimes make something brand new and leave a legacy. So these are very lofty ideals of entrepreneurs and there are the other kinds who get into it because of um, other reasons, not so lofty reasons, but valid enough. Uh, that um, they get into business because you know they think it's a it's a good way to easy way to make money. Actually, if you watch YouTube uh, many times, you would encounter videos of people you know marketers coming and trying to sell you things like uh, you know join this course and I'll teach you how to make your first million with no investment or uh, how to make your content start uh, making money for you, how to become a YouTube influencer, how to become an Instagram influencer. Many things. I mean, um, yes, of course, today it has made it, uh, digital uh, medium has made it possible for anybody to become an entrepreneur and get into the space and start earning money. But that is just uh, one of the reasons, right? Uh, also, um, some people get into entrepreneurial space because they think it's, you know, it affords them flexible hours because you don't have to uh, go to an office to report to anybody. You know, it could be your own boss. Uh, so, these are many reasons why people get into being an entrepreneur uh, and every reason is valid, you know, to each his own. But what we need to be uh, focused on is a lot of times we get into it because we think, you know, it's possible to break it or, you know, we think uh, we, we hear so many stories about entrepreneurial success all around us, all these unicorns coming out of India and all of those things, definitely inspiring. But we also have to be cognizant of the fact that many, many startup entrepreneurs have failed. The reason why we shouldn't only focus on the success story is that when we do that, we are opening ourselves to be biased by one side of the story, right? I mean, there are two sides to every coin. So whenever we say that, um, you know, whenever we restrict ourselves to seeing only one side of the story, we are losing out on valuable learnings from the other side. So, um, that is the reason why today we'll be talking a lot about mistakes that entrepreneurs make uh, and uh, also about how scaling, um, how these mistakes need to be avoided in order to scale your business. It was uh, Edison, Thomas Alva Edison, who said that 99% of my ideas have not worked out. That doesn't mean that I failed 99% of the time. It only means that I have learned how to, how not to do something from all these experiences. 
So it's important to recognize reality and start out your journey aware of your chances. So, growth versus scaling. What do I mean by that? You would think that growing, scaling, they're all the same. But actually, there's a very fine difference between the two terms. Now, growth of any business, the, the, the goal of any business is to grow. You can start out very small, but if you're not growing, there's no point in being in that business, right? So, growth is ultimately the aim of any business. The capitalist world is a, is a constant chase after growth. But in the startup space, growing, just growing is not enough. Reason, growth could be defined by many parameters. So growth could be growth of the size of your business in terms of revenue or it could be in terms of the number of employees you have or it could be the growth in terms of number of um, clients that you have. Or it could even be growing in terms of, you know, the spaces you have, the off number of offices you have, the number of countries you sell in. Growth could be defined in many ways. But growth comes at a cost. Because when you say growth, you're talking about spending to get to that growth. Money grows money. So unless you spend and invest in resources, growth is hard to combine. And that is what makes growth alone very difficult for startup entrepreneurs because what you actually need is scaling. Scaling is when a business grows by multiple times than what they have spent. It is growth that far outstrips, out, far outstrips your costs. So when a business scales, cost of a customer acquisition is much lesser than the lifetime value that the customer can offer your business. So there is a big difference between growing and scaling. In fact, the first things that the fund managers or the venture capitalists, angel investors, the first thing they'd ask is, any uh, startup entrepreneur seeking funds, the first question they ask is, what's your scaling model? Because without scaling, small businesses can't really sustain. It's okay for a big business to just grow at 10% a year because they're, they're operating on a big base. So even a small growth is in terms of value is huge. But when it's a small business, your base is, baseline is very low. So, just growing would not make sense. I'll explain how. Costs. So, let me just tell you about all the costs that's involved when you're setting out to start have a startup. Actually, if you look at it, you know, the, your first um, few thousands or a few lakhs could come out would come at literally no cost. That's possible. And that's what they sell you when they come and uh, promise you many things that this kind of digital business is easy and you can make money. This is what they promise you. The first uh, few thousand or a few lakhs or a few million, whatever. Right? Uh, but what happens afterwards? You're not happy with that, right? You want to grow. When you have to grow, that's when costs hit you. Just, just to list out a... Um, um, few types of costs that you're likely to be faced with. Identity of the business. Now, you could start out with just from a, you know, the basement business or a, or a garage business as they call it. But once you want to grow and, uh, you know, become a serious business, you have to have a business identity. That means you have to have a website, uh, you know, if you're a digital business, you already have that, but a logo, then you need business cards, letterheads, most importantly, you need tax registrations. And those things cost money and time. Um, compliance requirements. So all of these things take, they're not hugely expensive, they're not prohibitive, but they are, they are costs. And if you're 
just starting out with the, you know a few thousands in your pocket these things could uh, make a big dent then comes the costs of establishment like you know renting a space having uh, you know buying having to buy or rent a few computers or other equipments and hiring people that that is actually a, a big cost that plays a big spoil sport because when you have when you hire people you have, you have to make sure that you uh, you earn enough to be able to pay salaries and that is where a lot of startups slip up because if their cash flow cash flow is not regular then paying salary becomes a huge challenge then there are the costs of the of maintaining inventory so even if you don't hold inventory say you are a drop shipping business developing relationship with suppliers comes at a cost like returns will happen or uh, you will have to sometimes you have to buy things in bulk but uh, your sales will be uh, in in on discrete numbers so there are costs associated with holding inventory and then of course marketing expenses uh, digital marketing might be much cheaper than other forms of marketing but still it requires time energy and money so without uh, money and none of these things are possible and this is where just growing makes it impossible because costs come in big chunks or you know they come in uh, you can't just go and say i'll i'll uh, rent out a you know a small part of a room or something so the costs always come in in uh, bigger blocks whereas your revenue may not grow at the same rate and that is when just growing becomes uh, difficult i'll explain to you uh, from my own experience of uh, running uh, mayasar so when we started out we were just um, two women who were you know had a very interesting hobby of making fashion jewelry and we decided we'll start a facebook page and we started uploading our designs and uh, to our surprise at that time uh, it was um, selling was very easy online at that time because in fact uh, you won't believe that facebook's organic reach was more than 16% it's it's at 1% or something now so uh, without even spending much on uh, online advertising we started booking orders from all over the world and uh, we were very excited because we hadn't even anticipated that kind of a response um but then you know the growth bug <laughs> bit us and we wanted to grow so the first thing we did was we set up a website uh, as i said at that time uh, flipkart was just a bookseller so you can imagine website building was not as easy it is as it is today we spent a lot of money in designing a website that looked like crap actually but that was those were the templates available at that time and uh, you know we could only build what we saw in other places and uh, so uh, you know it came at uh, with some cost it even put some restrictions on the way we were selling and marketing but we started off and you know it was still doing well um and then what happened then uh, at that time i was in malaysia in kuala lumpur that's where i started the business and i had moved to move back to india in 2012 and when i then we moved to india we realized there's a huge market here and you know we were very excited okay now this market is something that we can really tap because anyway even before uh, our, most of our orders were coming from india uh, so we thought okay we can we can capture that our market and we got into the act now when we came here i realized that okay i needed to have a company registration then i needed to have a, a tax registration and for that i needed a, an office space so costs kept mounting so we did we had to do all that so we did it and then we realized also that uh, it was not easy uh, while i was in malaysia um, a lot of uh, raw material were easy to source there it uh, a lot of raw material for that business came from uh, far east so it was very easy to source after coming to india i we realized that it was not so easy to source those raw materials here because of import uh, duties and things like that so then we had to struggle to find raw materials and we finally um, found suppliers in uh, places like rajasthan but uh, they weren't willing to supply to a small time startup without uh, without some kind of a promise on volumes so we had to give them that so it just you know one after the other our cost kept mounting so even though we grew actually people who saw us thought that oh these 
girls are doing really well because you know look at them from what they were you know that now they have an office they have a beautiful website they are selling all over the world but only we knew that we were hard pressed for cash cash flow was always a, a was a, always an issue for us of course we have also had to hire people so at the end of it after 6 years of running it we had come to a stage where we couldn't sustain it anymore and then we had to shut shop um so um what we failed to do there was we failed to scale i'll tell you other uh, examples as well and uh, other things to watch out for i mean fast was just one of the uh, things uh, one of the problems we had there are also there were also other problems i'll get to them one by one so these are the top 5 mistakes that prevent businesses from scaling <clears throat> so top 5 mistakes that prevent business scaling let's talk about this now number 1 life's too short to build something nobody wants ash maurya is also a startup entrepreneur and this is what uh, he said now 42% of startups fail because they didn't solve a market need only businesses that focus on solving a problem for the customers succeed now what do i mean by solving a market need remember google glass much hyped about wearable uh, device that could uh, you know that made many things possible you could uh, you know click a picture uh, you could look at maps but if you think about it it was a failure of course they had to google pulled it out after a few years in the market it wasn't doing anything i mean their sales just was not going up they had spent a lot of money marketing it but they ultimately they pulled it off the reason it didn't solve any problem sometimes the problems are not even felt like when the apple ipod came nobody thought that they needed a music organizer it wasn't a need that was felt by people but it was a latent need in the sense that who wouldn't want the music to be organized in one place uh, a music that you can carry around in your pocket so when apple ipod came although um, it was a uh, it was a new product and a new idea it also solved a latent need that people had whereas products that come um, with a lot of uh, hype but doesn't really do anything for you uh, for the customers end up uh, failing for example in south india we eat a dish called sevai so it's like uh, it's rice noodles it's uh, you make a, a batter like for idli or dosa and then you steam it and then you um kind of make it you pr- put it into a press and you know you, you press it and like like a pasta maker it comes out as thin noodles it's a very uh, troublesome cumbersome process of making it um so uh, there when there was uh, this uh, new uh, product that was launched in the market by a startup that was actually it was really cool there there were lots of videos of it floating online and uh, i think a lot of nras were interested in it and it was a big success at the beginning because you know people thought it was like really nice because if you saw the video it was almost like magic so there was this big pressure cooker uh, kind of a device where in, in on in one level you would pour the batter and then uh, you'd lid it for some time and then the noodle started coming out on the top like you know it was like almost like a noodle fountain it was very cool to look at the videos but after 4 5 years i can't find it in the market anymore i recently learned that they have actually closed shop the reason uh, that product didn't do well although it offered a lot of promise was one seva was not something that people eat every day uh, this product was occupying too much space on people's uh, you know kitchen shelf it was is actually was very bulky and cleaning it was a nightmare so yes making seva is a cumbersome process but it's not something that people do every day so to invest in a in a in an equipment that was occupying space and also a pain to uh, clean you know it wasn't just the, the trade off wasn't just uh, enough for people to uh, go out and buy it. so after the initial euphoria i think people kind of you know the word got out that it, it was not worth 
and some people were even saying that if your batter consistency is not perfect uh, it wouldn't work at all so it was almost like you know play it was like a gamble you make the batter and you wait to see you know, if it would work it was too much of a gamble for people so this product just went out of the market so it it was a brilliant idea you know it looked very cool it was a beautiful idea but the market did not accept it the market's uh, problems were not solved actually if, uh, if if the product is just replacing one problem with another like you know the problem of steaming it and then squeezing out the noodles was replaced by the problem of storing a big bulky device and then cleaning it after use it so it didn't really solve the problem and that is why it went out of business so um, what happens many times is uh, um, a founder i also read about another startup that um, the it was I, I think it came out of an iit incubator incubator um these uh, founders had uh, they had used iot to make uh, you know switches in the home that uh, would switch on automatically in the evening when the light kind of started going down after some time they realized that the market acceptance was not there due to several reasons because uh, it was too expensive and you know how much time do people spend in the house going and switching on lights i mean it's something that you do without even thinking actually you pass by a switchboard and you switch on the light so it was not something it was a very cool idea because the founder thought it was a fantastic idea he was like you know he was using technology to do something but the market was not ready and it, it was not even a problem that they were solving so uh, it kind of failed um, so the uh, a lot of times the founder thinks they have a brilliant idea and without understanding without studying whether the market needs it sometimes um the market might have a need and your product might solve a part of it and after research you could maybe fine tune the product and then you know launch it later so unless you do that then unless you build a solution that combines your idea with what the market needs uh, business scaling is not possible number 2 lack of direction not lack of time is the problem zig ziglar is an american author uh who said this sometimes people get offended when you say that you know you lack direction because they think they're putting in the hard work and they're doing everything that's possible but it's not a problem of not doing the hard work it's actually a problem of not doing it in the right way or you know not doing what is essential to grow the business so uh, you know when we had uh, when we were running uh, mayasar we used to um, spend a lot of time going and um, participating in exhibitions actually hindsight is 2020 as they say and if i look back at it those were mistakes that we could have, should have avoided because what we realized was that these exhibitions you know we we pay a hefty sum to book a table there so it would go anywhere from 50000 to a lakh these uh, fancy um, you know five star hotel exhibitions um we'd always make like at least uh, 1000 rupee lesser than what we had paid to book the table i mean the sales out of that were only that much but you know we went there not expecting to sell a lot but to um, get a lot of contacts and get phone numbers and things like that but we realized that the number of people and you know, the footfall we saw on the kind of database that we were able to collect was definitely not worth the money that we had spent you know if we i had put uh, run um, facebook ads Uh, for lead generation i would have gotten a lot more leads than what i um, made going to these exhibitions so when you start out especially a lot of well wishers parents and their friends and uh, you know people around you your own friends they're all come up with lots of advice saying you know do this do that do this do this you know there's this uh, conference why don't you go there or this this, this networking opportunity why don't you go there you meet some people and when you're starting out you're also unsure you know um, no startup founder is 100% confident they're always the very um, you know that insecurity is always there in people's minds uh, or somebody would say that you know why don't you spend you know this is a great product is great idea why don't you get written up uh, about in the newspaper or you know spend on pr so i had done all that for my uh, startup so we had spent on getting articles written about us uh, in uh, newspapers and online portals what we realized for none of these activities directly translated into anything significant um and uh, in hindsight we realized that these were huge mistakes the money and the time spent on these kind of frivolous activities that was not really bringing us anything that 
doesn't um, guarantee immediate or I wouldn't say immediate or like even near term returns is a waste of time, especially when you're in the early stage startup uh, level. Or, uh, you know, doing collaborations with other brands or somebody else and, you know, somebody would come and tell us that, you know, we are selling saris and you're selling um, jewelry. Why don't we do something together? <laughs> we would do things like that and we realized that, you know, the sari actually ended up selling more than, you know, what uh, we did. So, so collaborations with other uh, brands without having a sure revenue model or networking, all of this is a big uh, waste of time and money. And uh, it is important that uh, entrepreneurs focus on activities that uh, bring in new customers and then you spend, actually you spend your time cultivating relationship with these customers because that would give you better returns than going and networking or I'm not saying don't network, don't do exhibitions, study whether that opportunity is really worth uh, the time and the energy uh, and the money that you're putting into it. If it doesn't, if it's just a vague promise of, you know, you could meet somebody or, you know, you could get this opportunity, it's definitely not worth it. Um, in actually, uh, some of these conferences are terrible. <laughs> I remember one instance when um, I went into a, somebody had said, you know, there's a startup conference happening in Chennai, why don't you come? So I went in and I realized that I was the only uh, female startup entrepreneur there among there were like some 50 guys doing mostly in the tech side of business. So me selling fashion jewelry online was like a, I was sticking out like a sore thumb there. Um, so putting all my, uh, you know, feeling left out aside, I did go do the networking, you know, exchange cards and things like that. And um, most of it came to nothing. But uh, there was this uh, one company uh, representative that was there. And uh, those guys were um, into, uh, what should I say? I can't remember the name of what they call themselves. But um, they came and told me that, you know, you're selling online, but how come you're not selling on Amazon or Flipkart? Then I said, no, mine is a boutique business and, uh, you know, I only have one piece of anything. You know, it would be a problem managing inventory if I put it up on multiple sites. Um, you know, how would I how would I track? So that's when they, they had said that, you know, this is what we have a, uh, we have a software for. If you, if you, you know, install this. We could uh, help you manage the inventory across multiple sites. You can use our uh, our uh, uh, interface to upload on many sites and all that. So it sounded promising and, you know, who didn't want to? At that time, uh, it was 2015. So, you know, um, Amazon and Flipkart were really making, had started making waves and, uh, you know, who didn't want to be on them? But um, so I signed up with them and uh, it was, and, you know, it was those early days when service providers were actually charging a big fee. So, you know, I had to spend a lot of money to get that software. And it was very complicated, actually. It was not even user-friendly. I ended up spending a lot of time learning how to use that software. And uh, then um, what we realized was once we signed up with Amazon, we realized that Amazon wanted us to only put pictures with white background. So all my pictures were, like, as I said, it was a boutique business. So all my uh, images of all my products were... Um, of uh, you know my jewelry with artistic background so that's how we had we had always run it and that that those are the stock or you know photos of my products so then we invested <laughs> we hired a we hired a photography team a professional photography team who would come and shoot in you know high resolution clarity and you know then who would it was easy to remove background and put it in white background and uh, then we said, you know, since we're getting a professional photographer, why don't we also hire a model? And until then, you know, I used to be the model or you know, somebody in the office used to model, but then we got a professional model. So you, you see how costs get, kept multiplying. Um, so, but, you know, all of these costs would have been justified if we had sold a lot on Amazon or, you know, at least enough to cover all the expenditures that we had. But uh, what happened was, uh, I mean, again, um, we realized later that it was a mismatch, the platform and the product, because um, my products were, as I said, boutique products, right? I mean, people were buying it because they were unique and uh, because they were like one of a kind. And uh, they also came with some kind of a, an artistry uh, and, and that was conveyed through their images or description and everything. The minute we uploaded it on Amazon, it looked the same as everybody else's because, you know, the, the photographs were, had the same kind of white background. 
Amazon forced you to write description that had keywords. So there was not none of these flowy, flowery languages that we usually uh, wrote description for our products with. So it had the product itself had lost a lot of its charm. Um, it kind of started looking very, uh, uh, what should I call it? It it became like mundane. You know, everybody else is, and in fact, um, people couldn't differentiate between gemstones that we were selling you know, versus the kind of you know uh, plastic or glass jewelry that others were selling on Amazon, and the price difference kind of showed to them. Obviously, uh, it was big, so um, it didn't make any difference. We got deadly squat out of that whole exercise, but we had spent a lot of money doing unnecessary things for the business. So at that time, I, I would say that we lost track of what we were doing and why we were successful. And we got pulled in different direction because we were too enthusiastic and we were too eager to grow. In that, we had lost sight of what was important to our business. Number three, individuals don't build great companies. Teams do. Truer words never said before. Um, actually, if you look at, um, you know, venture capitalists, they don't uh, like to invest in uh, startups that have that have one single founder because a team is very important in the success of any uh, venture. Statistics say that solo founder businesses take, they, they take like three and a half times longer to get out of the startup phase, basically to achieve scaling. But a balanced team has 3% um, more user growth than the team that doesn't have a balance. Uh, what do I mean by a balanced team? So for any digital business, for any business, and especially in digital business, it's important to have three kinds of skill sets. One is the visionary, the founder and the visionary who has, you know, uh, who has the uh, domain knowledge, who can think about product uh, improvements, so all of that. Then comes the marketeer. Because if you cannot, as I explained before, if you cannot make your product appealing to your customer, nobody's going to buy. So a skilled marketing mind is a must. Then you also need somebody who's a technologist who can help you in scaling. Like as uh, like I would be explaining uh, in the next point about how what is the importance of automation and technology in a startup business. So without these three skill sets, it's very difficult to uh, scale a startup. Now, you could uh, one could argue that one person could have all these skill sets, but it's very difficult because uh, these three are very, uh, they're a very weird combination of skills. They could be uh, somebody who's a visionary, who's also a marketeer, or, uh, or a marketeer who's, uh, or, or you know, a visionary who has a technology background. Who could uh, think technology uh, but a combination of all three is very rare to find unless you're Steve Jobs in fact even Steve Jobs he was not really the technologist in it he was you know, the Wozniak and the other guys were um, Steve Jobs was a visionary and a good marketer he was a great sales guy right uh, he could sell his ideas to the people so um, it's very difficult for one person to have all these skill sets so it is important for a startup to have more than one person. And, and I'm not saying when I mean a team, like you have a sales team, not that kind of a team. Team of decision makers, right? I mean, people who could make the decisions at the top. If it's a, if it's a company that has co-founders uh, or at least a, a CEO, a CFO, a CEO, then it has a better chance of succeeding because one, because now you have skill sets in all areas that's important for growth. The other one is that one person's time is not getting kind of, you know, pulled in different directions to different kinds of activities. If you have dedicated professionals doing or taking care of one part of business, it would definitely mean that uh, enough attention is paying to that side of growth. So it is important to have a well-balanced team. These three skill sets, being a visionary with the, the product knowledge, the marketer and, the, and a technologist. Number four, if you don't stay on top of your cash flow, you are going to put your business in a very dangerous position, says Jonathan Long. I can't tell you the importance of having good financial management in a startup enough. Because 
um, history shows that 82% of the time, poor cash flow management is the reason that uh, small business fails. What happens is, um, as a as a technologist or a, you have a great product, you have a great idea, you get into business and you start selling, and after some time you realize that you know your books are out of order or you've not kept track of all your uh, uh, of all your uh, costs, and uh, that kind of starts pinching you after a while. Several big startups have failed because they've mismanaged cash flow. Um, some of you might remember the startup called Stazilla. They were before uh, Oyo Rooms. Uh, and they were doing very well. It was a huge success story until they realized that there was huge uh, uh, financial mismanagement in that company. They had pros of outstanding with the uh, creditors. Um, and uh, ultimately, they had to roll, uh, you know, fold uh, shut shop because they just couldn't uh, carry on anymore. In fact, there were even some criminal cases against the founders. And that is how serious uh, cash management is. Um, when I say cash management, I if you're a really small business, okay, you can maybe manage the cash flow, you know, you can maintain an Excel sheet. But um, just keeping track of uh, cost and revenue is not sufficient. You also have to forecast, you have to budget. Uh, a balance sheet is very different from your cash flow statement. Um, also, you know, you have uh, regulatory compliance issues, right? A lot of companies, uh, even today, I mean, uh, some of my clients, we find that uh, they mismanage uh, GST payments. Uh, and that could uh, land a company in suit uh, because, you know, if you don't set aside funds that is due, I mean, you have to pay, pay you, you collect uh, GST from your client the beginning of the month, but the 20th, you have to file the, you know, pay the tax. But by that time, if you had spent that money, uh, you're in trouble. So uh, a lot of companies get into trouble because they don't keep track of these kind of payments um, and uh, paying salaries again that is also a, a big uh, liability uh, that you know recurring liability for companies so it is important to manage cash flows otherwise these kind of things will come to bite at the end of the month suddenly you realize that you don't have the cash to pay the salaries and that is a problem so having a dedicated accountant if not at least a consultant accountant is a definite must and it's not just an accountant, preferably look for somebody who can help you in planning, who could help you in forecasting, and give you the big picture, uh, who could help you look at data and say, okay, this is where you have to cut costs, you know, this is bleeding. Because even um, uh, if, uh, if you're looking at, you know, a good understanding of your costs and revenue, you could throw light on uh, where you're going wrong. Uh, especially in the service business, I see this a lot, where um, people don't bill for their time. I mean, a lot of times uh, founders do this. They don't bill for their time. And what happens is they will end up doing, uh, uh, you know, underpricing their products or service because they don't factor in the time that they have spent. After all, time is money. Once time spent cannot be, you know, gotten back. So um, keeping track of um, project costs. Project costs again is a very important uh, thing that uh, startups should do um, because a lot of times what happens is that. Um, you will, you know, if you do a analysis at the end of the month, you realize that one project, which was bringing in X revenue, has consumed like um, some 80% of your resources, whereas another project, which brought in maybe equal revenue, only consumed 20% of your resources. So, doing this kind of analysis helps you in, again, in focusing on what is important. If I had done that analysis about my exhibitions, I would have realized that, that they were a huge waste of time and money. So doing this, uh, doing um, uh, project costing, doing uh, you know, uh, forecasting and budgeting, all of that is very important. So it is important to invest in a good financial management uh, setup. Whether it is hiring somebody or consulting with somebody, it is important to do this. If there is one thing that you will outsource, it should be this definitely spend time on financial management. Number five, if you aren't investing in automation, you're missing out on a lot more than convenience, says Peter Desson. Um, well, automation, some, you know, it's a very misleading word. Automation, immediately you conjure up images of robots and things like that. But 
um, most of you would know that that is not true. Small businesses use automation a lot. When I say automation, it's about, it could be process automation, where uh, especially uh, things like marketing automation. In fact, small businesses using marketing automation see that their leads grow by 400% and uh, they're able to outgrow their competitors 63% of the time. So, um, marketing automation has been a big uh, boon to the startup industry. See, what automation does is, you know, of course, it saves you time, but it also allows you to streamline many processes and it allows you to uh, ensure that, uh, you know, if it is, if it can't be streamlined, it tells you there's a problem there. So, it allows you to um, iron out those wrinkles in your processes and it allows you to uh, scale without spending too much of additional resources. As I said, if you have to scale, you have to uh, make sure that you're able to acquire customers without spending too much uh, resource, right? Uh, the value of the customer acquisition has to be less than the value that the customer is going to bring in. Uh, and for that, automation is a very important aspect. So if you have a, you know, setting up a lead magnet and allowing online ads to run month on month is a great way to acquire leads you don't uh, if you have to like you know as i said if you have to go to exhibitions and display all of that is going to take time and that's really not automating anything right because you have to put in that effort every time and uh, that's a lot of time and uh, energy spent in addition to costs but if you can find ways to make these things run on auto mode then definitely then scaling is possible so anything that requires you to replicate uh, your efforts without uh, or you know replicate your success without uh, replicating effort is when you've achieved automation and it could be uh, in the area of marketing it could be in production it could be in uh, uh, sales in it could be in anything but uh, automating processes is a very important element for scaling so um automation is also when uh, you pr make something scalable by introducing uh, repeatable processes uh, for instance um, we have, there was a client of ours they they were a small startup they had a robotics uh, training academy so they would teach children how to uh, make you know small uh, robots with some robotics kits that they would give them and it was a very successful startup they had one center and uh, they had uh, trainers that were interacting with the children. They were doing very well. They had uh, children attending their academy and it was a very successful uh, venture. But when, uh, but they realized soon that this is not a scalable because it is uh, in order to, in order to, for them to replicate this, again, they have to invest in the space. They have to uh, get people as trainers. And this is what they were finding successful is to, Find good uh, trainers uh, because uh, this is not a it's not a skill that everybody has, right? Uh, robotics training is a specialized skill. Um, to f get trainers who are committed, who show up every day on time, and uh, who would actually uh, uh, you know be able to interact with kids in a friendly way, all of that was posing a big problem for them. And uh, they realized that uh, also with growth, uh, if they had to open, a, they, they, they did manage that. They did have like two, three centers they opened later and they realized that it was a big problem because one, the costs were also going up as and when they're opening a new center um, and uh, they, the getting trainers was a problem. So that's when they realized that they have to do automation and uh, they um, converted it. They took some time. They invested some time and energy and money into it, but they made everything into a uh, interactive video uh, game kind of a format where all the instructions came from the from the you know set itself right? so we the kids would come to the center they'd interact with the module they had uh, computer i mean station set up and they would just uh, do it do all the robotics building themselves so when when they did that they were able to scale so quickly uh, within uh, within a year they went up from three or four centers to 75 centers uh, and 75 places where they were training kids. So that, that is when business scaling is possible, when you uh, when you are able to quickly go from, you know, 1x to 10x. That is when uh, business scaling uh, happens.
So uh, we've seen the five um, problem areas or you know pitfalls to avoid when uh, running a startup and having a startup. So scaling, when I say, say scaling is successful only when cost of customer's acquisition is less than the lifetime value <coughs> excuse me, of the customer. Uh, lifetime value doesn't mean that you, you know, wait or uh, what a customer could bring you 10 years down the line. No. Lifetime value for a startup especially should be maybe a, a time of six months to a year. So if you if you spent money and time acquiring a customer, they should be able to uh, pay you back within six months or a year at the most. And then after that, whatever else they bring in would be what contributes to your scaling. Uh, and as I said, customer acquisition has to be on autopilot mode. You can't be uh, you can't be reinventing the wheel every time acquiring customers. So if you cannot acquire customers or based on an automated process, then something is wrong. You have to go back to your looking at tweaking your processes or maybe even see whether the market has accepted uh, your product because otherwise this should be easy, right? And uh, you should be uh, as a founder, should be able to spend time planning uh, versus doing. And, um, many startup founders end up doing all the all the work themselves. You know, they say yes. Of course, a lot of times it is one man show or a one woman show. But doing everything yourself would only um, end up uh, making you look like a headless chicken. You'd be running all over the place. So wherever possible. Hire people, of course, if you are, uh, you know, your budgeting and forecasting allows that. And uh, wherever possible, outsource work. But of course, ensure that it is work that is absolutely essential, not uh, work that is, you know, has a vague promise associated with it. Um, so ensure that you spend your time planning uh, or like in interacting with customers and things like that, where you are. Your time should be spent in growing and scaling the business, not in actually doing the everyday job. Like, you know, if you are the one who has to pack the, uh, your drop shipping packages, you're not going to scale, right? Somebody else has to be doing that. If you are sitting and, you know, licking uh, labels and sticking, uh, putting uh, seller tape in the packages, that's not going to scale. I mean, it's, there's no way that that business is going to scale. So it's important that these kind of processes are uh, either outsourced, given to other people who can run it, while well, you can focus on the most important part, planning the scaling of the business. So this is um, when uh, growth hacking is a word that you have all heard about. Growth hacking is nothing but the ability to scale your business or you know finding strategies to quickly grow your business so that it scales. And uh, the very important aspect of uh, growth hacking is to um, speeding up the process of the sales funnel like you know the process of acquiring customer and then um, the time taken for them to be hooked for them to get interested in you to buy the product and become a, become a uh, brand ambassador or you know brand advocate that process has to be sped up and uh, the faster the, <coughs> the faster the sales funnel moves the quicker the growth happens, right? Uh, because if, if it, you, again, this is where automation comes in. By automating these processes, this process can be sped up. Whereas if you had to send out, uh, say, salespeople to go talk to your customers, convince them and do all of that, those things take time. Um, but when it's an automated process, this the sales funnel runs very smoothly. So um, number one step is to acquire the customer where either you use a lead magnet or some um, marketing automation tool um, um, to acquire customers in a sense, show your business to them, get them hooked on and get them to uh, come and see you. And then you have to activate them where once now that they are interested, you have to ensure that um, they are convinced to buy your product. Now, okay, next step is, okay, once they've bought the product, it's not enough, right? As I said, the cost of customer acquisition has to be less than their lifetime value. This is only possible if they keep coming back to you, 
to buy again and again in fact 60% of uh, a good you know a successful startup will have 60% of its revenue from repeat customers so um, in order to have that you have to have strategies to retain these customers so follow the follow up with them give them you know if they have any grievances address that i mean this doesn't have to happen like uh, in a, again these this process also can be automated so you ensure that your customers come back to you for uh, buying again and then also induce them to become your brand of advocates by um, giving them incentives to refer you like it could be like a coupon a referral coupon or there are many things that you can do so i'm not going to be giving you specific uh, techniques here so we are talking on a more general terms here so these are the four stages to uh, customer acquisition and retention so this has to be this has to be this process is where you have to focus your attention attention on as a startup founder this is where most of the attention has to go as to how this process can be streamlined how this can be automated how um, wrinkles can be eliminated here and how you can ensure that the customer is happy and retained other tips this is uh, probably applicable to all businesses uh, more so for startups um, don't do something because it sounds cool a lot of times uh, new technologies and things like that excite you and uh, you want to use them for your business as well but uh, don't go and adopt something because it's cool or it's the latest thing or the in thing uh, unless as i uh, mentioned earlier you have to focus on what will immediately generate meaningful revenue or meaningful customer uh, connect if that doesn't happen if it's a vague promise or if it's a far uh, you know it's a distant promise don't invest in that right away and number 2 don't do something because others are doing it this is again something that a lot of companies end up doing uh, they you know it's important to follow your competitors it's important to follow the market to see what others are doing you know to learn but don't do something because others are doing it if if it's valuable if it makes sense for your business then adopt it again here an example would be from uh, google the google uh, plus so they had already uh, been uh, facebook and twitter and google didn't want to be left out of the game they, so they came with their own uh, uh, social uh, networking uh, platform but uh, google plus lacked any of the user uh, or you know um, the easy use of interfaces that the other uh, social media platforms offered and uh, sometimes i feel google created some things like you know the circles and things like that only to differentiate themselves from others without uh, without really uh, making a difference by that differentiation you know the customers didn't see the value in the differentiation it was only there for the sake of it and uh, it was a total failure i mean it was a it never gathered steam like the other social networks did and slowly it had to be phased out and now it's completely dead so um, even big businesses do this these mistakes uh, because they don't want to be left out and because uh, they see potential and they say, think that you know there is always space for one more player in the market and they get in um and the reason they you know if it's fine even if it's a, you know you are replicating somebody else's success as long as you put customers first and this is where several businesses fail um as i said there sometimes you get into the business because you think it's a, it's a great idea you think it's a it's a big innovation and things like that but unless the customers are put first you know whether if unless you're pro- solving their problem unless you're putting their needs at, at, uh, at the uh, up front it's not going to happen uh, because adoption will be very slow and uh, slowly it is it won't work so we saw a um, few important points about what uh, mistakes startup founders can avoid uh, of course i'm i'm only so far i only talked about uh, early stage startups when uh, we didn't cover anything about startup you know funded startups that have money to play with and you know the mistakes those kind of startups make are uh, you know there are there and there that needs a separate discussion um so this is all about early stage startups you know students like you who who have a startup who get out of college and you have a startup so these are the things that you have to watch out for um of course there are always factors and forces beyond your control uh, you know market could change overnight because some factor changed or like you know something like a pandemic strikes and your your you know business is wiped 
those things we cannot control those are beyond our control and we cannot plan for those things but small mistakes that you can anticipate and avoid uh, are what we covered today uh, hope it was interesting for you and hope it is it was useful for many of you if you have any queries if you would like to get in touch with me my email address is priya@prikullab.com you can even look, look me up on my company's website uh, prikullab.com and uh, i'd be happy to take queries or if you have any queries now I, we can discuss them it was a very nice session uh, thank you so much thank you hetik this business school for giving, giving me this opportunity bye